Hey everyone, um, my name is Katie and in this talk I'm going to talk about how to get into bug bounty in current year. Um, I see a lot of the time, and myself included here, when we talk about how to get into bug bounties we're often sharing quite outdated resources that doesn't necessarily reflect what the bug bounty landscape looks like at the moment. So this is what the talk is going to be about. This is very much an introductory talk. If you're not introductory you probably don't need to watch this talk. Um, but in case you don't know who I am, my name is Katie. Uh, my day job is a PhD student in machine learning and cybersecurity. Although I will say I'm far more well known for my bug hunting. Um, I call myself an occasional bug bounty hunter because as you can imagine, I don't have a ton of time every week to be uh, devoting to bug bounties. So I kind of make quite a lot of educational videos on YouTube. My channel is inside a PhD. That's not inside a PhD, um, insider as an insider threat. And that's not PHP, the programming language, but PhD, the academic qualification. Yes, I do have to put inside a and PHP in my tags so that way people who mistype it can still find my videos. Um, and I'm self-taught in security. I really have no formal training in security. I have no certifications. I don't have anything. Um, my previous job was as a data scientist and developers, and I've just accepted the job as a lecturer in cybersecurity. So in terms of where I come from and my bug bounty journey, I started learning bug bounties in June 2019 when I was, uh, I applied to be a mentee at a Hacker One Live event and I got in um, and at that event I didn't think I'd find anything. I actually found two bugs my very first time using any of the tools. I've gone on to now find over 30 bugs in real software, some of which you've heard of some of which you've used um, and that's kind of my background. I also run a YouTube channel, my YouTube channel is inside a PhD. I pretty much only make videos on bug bounty hunting and I've talked about how to find your first bug, how to choose targets, um, as well as like professional skills, um, how to start stop learning and start hacking, how to set goals, um, I've also done stuff like talked about how to get started using some software and tools like Burp and FFUF. I've talked to other bug bounty hunters about what it's like. I've talked about people who run bug bounty uh, programs. So I'd make a lot of very focused bug bounty content. Um, and I'm currently at like 18,000 uh, subscribers, which is just wild to me. I never thought I'd ever have that many. And I'm on track to hit um like 20k by the end of the year it's just it's been crazy how much support i've gotten from this community so that's my kind of background um and in terms of why you should listen to me and how i'm going to establish my credibility to you um but like i said this talk it's all about this kind of um you know now that's what i call bug bounty 2020 is kind of how i've been calling it um and i get asked this a lot like I don't know anything, how do I get into bug bounty? And I find that the resources that I send are out of date, the resources other people recommend are out of date. And that's not because, you know, we're all like living in the past. We're like, oh yeah, this is what I learned and this is how I learned to do it. But actually the bug bounty landscape is very different than what it was potentially when quite a lot of the people, a lot of people look up to in terms of what bugs get fined, which bugs are the most common, which bugs pay out, and also the range of targets. There's far more bug bounty platforms now. There's so many differences to even like three or four years ago. So this is kind of a beginner's guide specifically for 2020, 2021, and it's designed for someone completely new to bug bounty, someone who's never like who's heard of it, who's interested, but doesn't really know what to do next and how to kind of get into it. Um, so the whole theme of this talk is going to be very introductory. If you're familiar with bug bounties, this is not the talk for you. But if you're sitting there being like, I don't really understand this, but it sounds kind of cool. I'm kind of interested. I hope this will be an interesting and useful talk for you to listen to. Um, I'm going to avoid recommending my own resources um, during this video, but I will say that quite a lot of the stuff I talk about, I've got videos on. So if you like the way that I explain things, 
you can check out my YouTube channel, um, but I'm going to make recommendations for a lot more content than just mine. So let's start with what is bug bounty anyway? Like, what does it mean? What is it? Um, let's start at the beginning. How do we do it? So in a nutshell, bug bounties are freelance cybersecurity. So usually what happens in a big company when they want someone to test their stuff is that they hire a penetration tester. And a penetration tester comes in and they test the network and they test all of this. Now there's a bit of an issue there, which is that a lot of penetration testers think the same way. And that tends to be what kind of happens is you get the same vulnerabilities. Um, the advantage of really using bug bounty hunters is that they're experts, they're freelance cybersecurity experts, but they often have a different way of thinking. Um, they are like creative, they don't necessarily have formal training. Um, and for something like a penetration test, that might be quite a negative um, because they're like, oh, they don't really know what they're doing. But actually having somebody who can kind of come from the outside, look at what you're working on and say, this is where I see issues. These are the issues you found or I found in your stuff um, is a huge advantage for like being in a organization, a company. Um, and the way it works is that we find vulnerabilities and a target or a company then pays out per vulnerability found. And this payment will depend very hard, like a lot on what the risk is. So we might use something more f like formal, like um, the common vulnerability uh, assessment scoring, um, the CVSS. We might be looking at something custom like the VRT. Um, or we might be looking at this is a high, this is a low, this is what we think it's worth. And really the difficult part in this is proving that the risk you are stating is the risk of the vulnerability. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but you know, vulnerability, the payment you get for a bounty is really varied. Like it can be less than $100 all the way up to like $100,000 for a single vulnerability that affects multiple servers. So there's quite a lot of variability in how much you get paid. Now with that in mind, a lot of people do do this as a full-time job. Um, obviously with the variability and um, the like difficulty in actually finding these, a lot of people just do it for fun, do it as a hobby, do it to show their security skills. Um, so in terms of like a too long, didn't read, didn't watch, didn't listen, um, hack stuff get paid. Um, but notably hack stuff get paid freelance rather than hack stuff get paid by your employer. Um, and really this kind of, kind of forces us to ask this question, which is what is a bug? Now, when we think about bugs, and we talk about bugs in games, um, we're really talking about software issues where something just doesn't work, right? Now, something really important to note about bug bounty hunting is we're not hunting for regular bugs um, because those don't have much of a security impact. What we're interested in is software issues which have that security impact, security vulnerabilities. Now, this may well be it's working as intended, like this is how this software is supposed to work, but maybe the developers didn't understand the wider security implications of that vulnerability being available or the wider security risks of, say, um, something being uh, private or public when it should have been private. Um, and the kind of thing that makes bug hunting hard is not just that you need to find them, but you need to find them and be able to exploit them and play that role as the attacker. And I always think about this um, as being Sherlock Holmes. And then somebody told me, aren't you more Moriarty? And I thought, yes. <laughs> so we're not Sherlock Holmes, we're Moriarty. We're trying to figure out what the issues are 
we're finding them, we're exploiting them, and we're playing that role. We're trying to show the full impact. Now, this is the hard part quite a lot of the time. A lot of people will think, okay, cross-site scripting, it's a vulnerability, but they don't show necessarily the full impact, that full exploitation. And that's what's quite difficult about bug bounty hunting and why you see some people who can make tons of money and some people that sometimes don't make as much simply because there's a difference in how you explain impact and how you demonstrate that impact to somebody. And the next question I always get asked is, is that legal though? Now this is usually from my parents who are worried about me. Um, but I get this question, I get this a lot, you know, is this legal? How do I know I'm being legal? Because as we know, there's a difference between ethical hacking and legal hacking. Just because you're being ethical doesn't mean you're doing something um, illegal. And just because something is legal doesn't mean it's ethical in many cases, not just in cybersecurity. So there is, in fact, a kind of grey area in that. And I'll talk about the grey area. But for the most part, bug bounties are 100% legal as long as you follow the rules of engagement. Now, often when you look at a um, bug bounty program, they'll have their own rules. It will be things like, please don't delete all of our files. Um, please only keep your hacking to these assets. Please, we're not interested in these low risk vulnerabilities or we know there's an issue here. You don't have to test the asset. We're aware and we're fixing it. And they're listed on either the program page or on the website itself. So what that means is that you have permission as long as you follow those rules. Once you step outside of those rules, that's when you lose the permission aspect. Now, often you'll also be granted safe harbor as well, um, which is again a form of permission, but that might be maybe sometimes a bit more permissive as saying, okay, if you are out of scope, um, we might not pay, for example, but we won't call the police. Um, and this is going to vary wildly in terms of um, like programs and stuff like that. And there are cases where somebody acting from a bug bounty uh, program was referred to the FBI recently. Um, and that happens. But the important thing is that as long as you follow the rules, you are not breaking the, breaking the law. Um, and you don't need to worry and most platforms will back you up your lawyer will have a very easy time the often the customer will also back you up so don't worry about breaking the law as long as you follow the program terms now some people do go out of scope and some people do start hacking and i'll talk about this in a minute on websites they don't have explicit permission to hack they really shouldn't if you do that, you're obviously taking your own risk and nobody else can be held liable for that risk but you for choosing to do it. With that in mind, as long as you follow the rules, you're fine. Trust me, you're okay, you're fine. Everything will be okay. Um, there are many people who do this all the, all the time. Um, the one thing I will say is when you're learning, don't start hacking random websites. Please do keep it to bug bounty websites to vulnerability disclosures because otherwise you know you're taking a risk you don't have permission I don't recommend doing that so I talked a lot about a bug bounty platform but I haven't actually said what they are so bug bounty flat platforms are third parties which host bug bounty programs um, you can kind of think of them as middlemen for a company, they help do things like triage, they manage the program, they talk to the uh, target and, you know, they talk, okay, what kind of assets do you want in scope? Okay, um, have you thought about adding this asset or looking at what the security team could manage? Sometimes they'll also be providing triage services, so looking at bugs that come in and making sure that they're high priority. Um, they also have a range of like spam filtering where they can help with that sort of stuff, with duplication as well. Um, and what they do offer for like a person, so like a hacker, is you can hack a wide range of different companies. You don't just have to hack one website. 
and they help, they'll be the people that manage your payments, they'll be the people that give you invite-only programs, and there's a really big range of them. Now, some work very differently to others, um, some have very traditional bug bounty pro- programs and some don't. For example, HackerOne and BugCrowd are the two largest. Um, they focus on big range of customers, they pay out with all the traditional payout methods. Um, then you start have Senac, which is a little bit um, like it, it's a little bit smaller, but not by much. And they also have Synac Red Team, which is like elite hackers, which are chosen by the program, the platform. Um, you have uh, pro, uh, bug bounty platforms like Integrity, which offer European customers. Same with Zerocopter, both focus more on European. Detectify, Crowdsource, which operates a completely different model. And all of these basically work slightly differently. So, I mean, how do you pick who you're going to go with then? Um, most people do it on target. So here are some targets uh, that you can hack. Uh, we've got everything from the US Air Force to games companies like Nintendo to, you know, kind of more traditional corporate Verizon, Goldman Sachs, HP, to techie companies, GitHub, PayPal, uh, Tesla, um, to kind of more very techie, so DigitalOcean, which are providing services for um, tech customers. And, you know, it's going to depend on which platform that hosts different programs. So if you want to hack Uber, you have to use HackerOne. If you want to hack MasterCard, you're hacking on BugCrowd. And these are really like a very small proportion of the customers that you can hack. These are public programs. There's a ton which are going to be private, which are open to invite only. Hackers, there are some which are launching new every single day. Um, Some will require specialist skills. There's so many different ways to look at these. One of the best things to do is to just see what interests you. Now, that could be, you know, products and services you already use. That could be things you're familiar with. That could be, you know, oh, I made a hacker one account, so I'm just going to look at what they have. There's no strict way of choosing a target. And I made an entire video on how to choose a target and things to consider. So... I've talked about bug bounty platforms, but actually you don't need to use a bug bounty platform. So many companies run external bug bounty programs. Facebook and Microsoft both run one. And even smaller companies may reward a bounty for disclosing a vulnerability, even if they don't have a formal bug bounty program. Now, this this is when we start to get into the gray area. Although you are ethically hacking, you're not doing so legally. That is, you do not have permission, you do not have safe harbour. Without explicit permission, they might not take kindly to that. Um, And if you are trying to disclose a vulnerability, you only have to look on places like Twitter or a news article to see when people have uh, disclosed a vulnerability and had legal action taken on them. Asking for money is just going to make that so much worse and... My suggestion is to avoid doing that. A lot of people think that's the best way to get started in bug bounties. I completely disagree. I don't think you should take a personal risk like that. And we all know hacking is not a crime. Um, Hacking is a thing we do. But when we start to do stuff without permission, that's when we start to get into the crime aspect of it. But hacking itself, completely legal, completely able to be done on on the bug bounty platforms or on external bug bounty programs like Facebook and Microsoft. And actually, even some open source projects may have bug bounties available. So it's not just um, big companies that have really deep pockets. Sometimes it's little companies, sometimes it's open source. Uh, it's your choice whether or not to use a bug bounty platform and which bug bounty platform you use. A lot of people prefer not to. They don't like the support aspect of it. Uh, So it's completely up to you. If you're completely new and you're not sure yet, I would recommend signing up to one of them and just seeing whether or not it might be for you and having a go. Um, Bug bounty platforms also offer a degree of like kudos when... You know, you find a bug, um, you can get more private invites, you get a kind of reward there. 
so that can be kind of cool. Uh, but enough on enough on the introductionary stuff. Let's talk about what bug hunters actually do. Um, and here is my recipe on how to become a bug hunter and how to report a bug, really. Our ingredients, we're going to need Burp Sweep or OWASP Zap. We're going to need something to hack. We're going to need some knowledge about bug hunting. And our recipe is hack the target, whatever that means, write the report, and then get paid. Um, so the get paid aspect of the recipe can vary because some won't award traditional bounties. Um, some will award swag, some will award just nothing and they're just vulnerability disclosures only, what have you. But let's talk about this kind of recipe. So the first thing is Burp Suite and OWASP Zap. So this is kind of the biggest tool you'll use as a bug bounty hunter. They both do the same thing, they're proxies, they sit between your computer and the server to show what's being sent and received. Um, but why do we care about that? Well, that's, we care because we want to see how we can manipulate a request to res to change the response. So how can we change what we send in order to get something different back? Um, and that's the main thing that they offer. There's a bunch of other tools that get included, like there can be content discovery, there can be... Um, brute forcing, there can be uh, a ton of other stuff that gets included. Like there are, for many of these, there's tons of plugins. You can also add add to that functionality, write your own functionality. But primarily the point of what we're trying to do is we're trying to slightly change um, the request and then see what the response is in return. And that's it. Uh, so that's okay. We know what burp is. We need some knowledge about bug hunting because we know what targets we've signed up or we've decided to do a um, different bug bounty program it doesn't have a is not a platform but we need to know what we're looking for and nicely we just get told what we can look for um hacker one publishes the most common vulnerabilities one just came out as i'm recording this um about what the most rewarded vulnerabilities have been for them recently and what tends to hit number one is almost always cross-site scripting However, what I will say about cross-site scripting is that it used to be a lot easier. It's a lot more difficult nowadays to find cross-site scripting and cross-site scripting involves quite a lot of um, like little tricks and, tri and tricks that other people use to try and bypass filters. Filters are a lot more common. And what that is, it's the ability to inject JavaScript onto a page. It's the typical alert zero. Um, they then have improper authentication. So that is, you don't know who is, um, or, or someone isn't logged in and can access something. It's primarily revolved around login systems. We then have information disclosure. So that is something is public that shouldn't be. That can be everything from, oh, I just went through a bunch of files and I found this very detailed file that shows the exact, pr like, uh, income that this company has made from hey um, people's passwords are being disclosed and they're some of the like the widest range of bugs you can find um, privilege escalation the ability to take your account from a normal user up to an admin SQL injection the ability to access the database by injecting in SQL commands code injection and um, the ability to inject code server-side request forgery, which is a really interesting vulnerability that uses the website as this kind of gateway into internal resources. Um, insecure direct object reference or IDORs, which are, you, you don't check that someone has, or someone should have access to a resource before you let them do it. Improper access control, you haven't properly checked that somebody should have access to a resource and CSRF, which is about cookies, but has largely kind of been solved by recent change to Chrome. Now, okay, what can beginners find in this list? Information disclosure does not require any technical skills. IDOs, improper access control, improper authentication. Now, IDOs require a little bit more technical skills, but for the most part are pretty straightforward. Improper authentication, access control tend to be a little bit harder. 
If you're learning this right now and you're listening to me talk, I would focus on information disclosure and IDORs. I think they are by far some of the easiest vulnerabilities to find. Uh, Report writing. So once we find a vulnerability as hackers, we also have to show that we can exploit it. And we do this by writing reports. So we'll uh, we'll see like the asset, we'll write the weakness, we'll say the severity, we have the title, and then we kind of have this like free text where we then do like a little summary what the issue is, um, what the steps to reproduce are, the asset affected, um, the specific uh, scoring in terms of severity, um, any supporting references materials now the really important part of this is impact impact is what bug hunting is about impact is so important to um what we do as bug hunters because again like i said we're not just finding vulnerabilities we've got to exploit them and to exploit them we've got to look at okay Um, this is going to be a high because you can do X, Y, Z and that's super dangerous. Um, So once you've done that and you've reported the vulnerability, it then goes to the customer who will look at it, who will check and see if the severity is correct. If it's managed, it might go through a triage first, but then you kind of have this back and forth. And I'm just going to show you what that looks like now. So this is a bug reported by um, this hacker, Coral Dev, And they found a reflected XSS at this particular URL. Um, it was disclosed, so it's completely public now. And it was reported to Razor. Now we can see the asset here was just web assets. Um, You might find specific URLs, you might find apps in there, but they're just assets. We then have the weakness and the bounty. Um, So the weakness here is cross-site scripting reflected. The bounty $750, which is a pretty good bounty. And they've got the severity there as high. So this is kind of where our report writing from the previous slide comes in. This is our kind of main summary. We then have the main report. So here we can see we've got the summary, the steps to reproduce, and then the impact. So here we've got, you know, the summary is you can uh, do a reflected cross-site scripting, the steps to reproduce, I'll click this link, and you can see this text box appear. Uh, Now the impact statement here has been an attacker can Um, execute scripts in the victim session so that's quite a high severity depending on what they could do with it whether that might be you know everything from change someone's password to delete their account to something more target specific and what's important to note from this is actually the conversation doesn't just end there there's this whole timeline where you have a back and forth with developers Um, and you have a back and forth with the team and you can check on the progress of your bug and see what's happening with it. So here the hacker had asked for an update. The program got back and said, hey, we don't have an update, but thanks for waiting. Um, And then it's kind of been this continued um, kind of back and forth. It's not just submit a report, it goes into the ether and then we don't care. There's actually quite a lot in there that isn't just that kind of very basic progress so that's bug hunting i mean that's at the core what bug hunting is Uh, people will show you you know they'll brag about the nice cars they have but this is what bug hunting is like primarily it is this process you hack something you find a vulnerability you report it and then it gets paid out now what's quite i think alluring about this is the fact you get paid for it and it's very nice to feel rewarded in that way um and i've done an entire video on why that can't be the only reward you get but it's quite nice so the question then comes okay if you're interested in this what do you actually have to learn and how on earth do you learn it what do you need to do to actually get started um and i'm gonna tell you so these are what i think are the four steps or five steps sorry um the first is to learn how the web works so that's everything from http requests responses um how tcp ip works 
how the entire like how cookies work why HTTP is stateless all of that stuff goes in there the best way to learn that is usually through textbooks or Wikipedia it's quite academic but that's step one step two is to um, learn how to use burp or zap so burp and zap are both proxies talked about it before there's so many different ways to learn it primarily you can like look at videos there are some uh, ctfs that will require it it's just practice for the most part though it's just becoming confident in using the tools burp and zap are going to be your most common tool the next one looking at is what bugs are actually out there and how to exploit them now these are very closely related but ever so slightly different so which bugs are out there is something like okay cross-site scripting exists how to exploit them is then okay what's the actual impact of cross-site scripting how do you get that large impact because yes we can just fire alert zero but actually there's a lot more interesting impacts of xss than just firing an alert off um, and there's a lot we can show to get that higher payments from that so they're very closely linked for quite a lot of them um, they're going to be the same but for some it's slightly different the other thing to note with that particular stage is that there's going to be bugs with very wide ranging impacts depending on context um, so that's really important to consider is that sometimes the impact might be a low a medium sometimes it might be a crit depending on where it is especially when we start talking about something like information disclosure information disclosure on say for example um, medical data huge impact information disclosure on something that's already public nah, debatable whether or not that would even be a bug and then the final step is to practice exploiting them now bug hunting is all about practice practice makes perfect and if you want to get into hacking you've got to practice now whether that is ctfs or um whether that is actually hacking something it's all up to you but you've got to practice you can't just get good at bug hunting by watching videos um even if they're my videos and therefore the best videos <laughs> um and one other important thing that i think gets lost in this conversation is that you should learn more than one vulnerability um, because there's no point practicing cross-site scripting again and again and again you should make sure you're varying it just to make sure it still remains interesting to you and you're still interested in pursuing this so before i get too much into learning i i want to talk about learning in general now when you go off and do your own research on this you'll often find people saying this is how you learn bug hunting in 2020. now i realize this is how the um title the slide were titled um, but there's actually lots of different ways to learn bug hunting not just one um, and quite a lot of people will try and sell you stuff and like say oh yeah i'll teach you everything you need to know for only four four dollars a month or whatever and there's no resource that i can recommend that will teach you how to do like these four steps or five steps sorry from start to finish and there's no critical knowledge mass that you need either so when somebody says i've got everything you need to learn no to get started um it's actually not true because people have gotten started with a ton of security knowledge and some people have got started with barely any some people have taken courses some people have read books some people watch videos there's nothing there that is the absolute method of learning now so as much as i've titled my presentation to be a bit of clickbait there's so many different ways of learning and you kind of need to figure out what you need and look for those resources it's a continuous process um and this isn't scientifically backed up um and i think it's been debunked quite a few times but i like this way of of thinking about um how we learn so the best way to um, learn is to by teaching others and the worst way to retain information anyway is by doing lectures now what's actually true is not this exact pyramid but you need a mix of a bunch of different ways to fully engage your brain um, and there are many different ways of learning something 
even if you don't know that much, you can still learn a lot by trying to teach it somebody else. And I know this because my entire video series is based on it. I don't know that much. I'm not a fountain of hacking knowledge. I just know a little bit. And from that, really what the best thing to do is, is to immerse yourself. That doesn't just mean consume really easy stuff at your current experience level. It means you go deep. You read things you don't quite understand yet, but you still try. You follow people on Twitter who post complex stuff. You read disclosed reports to understand people's thinking process. You don't just go begin a hacking tutorial. You immerse yourself like you're learning a language in the entire like community aspect that we that we have and really that's the combination of things you do a little bit of all of these combined with immersing yourself that's how you learn how to hack but i realize that that's not very helpful because that's not something very actionable so with that in mind let me talk about some resources um, I have an entire video on like all of these resources in depth, but I want to just break it down by the kind of um, steps before. So how should you learn how the web works? There are so many free resources for this one. Wikipedia, Web Hacking 101, tons of online tutorials. There are so many tutorials. If you type in how does HTTP work, how does TCP IP work, there'll be loads of them. Um, any kind of courses on web dev will also go through it. And those are both paid courses and free courses. You definitely don't need to go to university to, f to understand how the web works. And the kind of really important part of this is understanding the key terms, since they're going to come up a lot. Like knowing what a response is, a request is, what the word stateless means. All of those terms are technical terms that are going to come up. And knowing them when you first get started will just make that so much easier in the long run. Plus, it means that when you write a report, you have the language to explain it to somebody else. And you can kind of explain things to that person in the language that they understand. So that's my recommendation is going to be Wikipedia, Web Hacking 101, online tutorials, just Google it. Um, as much as I hate saying that, because I assume people can Google things and they come to me because they, they, they're stuck. Um... All of that stuff, great place to start. Now, next is how to use Burp and Zap. So this is Burp's interface if you're not familiar with it. Um, Burp and Zap are the main tools that bug bounty hunters use. Now, it's not the only tools we use. We use quite a lot of other tools, but it's the main one. And what's really important is to get the most out of them. So some things like being able to modify requests and see the response, that is by far the most important feature and something you will always use. That is the core of hacking, or at least web hacking anyway. To look at something and go, okay, what if I change that zero to a one? What if I change that zero to minus a million? What if I change this price? What if I change this parameter? What if I put in an XSS payload? What comes out? And the kind of important part next is to look at what the response is and then adjust accordingly you know if you get told you don't have permission to do that you can pretty much um rule out some vulnerabilities however for something like xss if you put it in and the response comes back filtered in some way you adjust you come back and you try and approach it in a different way so you try um replacing characters you try what if i do a blind xss because it's getting truncated because it's too long um, and stuff like that. So the best way to kind of get used to this is to practice. Now, the more you practice with it, the more familiar you're going to become with it. But I realise it's quite a daunting thing to just be given and told, find, bu find bugs with this. Um, and the best thing you can do is going to be to look at some videos, look at some courses, especially if you're, you need or you feel like you need that directed learning. Um, I've made videos on Burp, but there are other way more videos out there if you don't like the way I explain things. So if you want to look at other resources, there are so many out there. I will say articles aren't the best way to learn with using software because um, it's not always clear. Um, it's quite a different experience to watch somebody use a piece of software and see how they approach it. Um, but that's my only recommendation with that. So, okay, what comes next? Well, 
These are the two linked ones, which is what bugs are out there and how to exploit them. Now, although I think these are two quite different ideas, they're often joined together. Uh, and this is where you find so many resources, like so, so many resources. Um, there's videos, articles, write-ups, podcasts, conferences, more come out every single day talking about bugs people find and how they exploited them. Um, write-ups and disclosures are excellent at this because I think it's quite good to see how the landscape of bug bounties is changing. Um, but if you get completely overwhelmed, like I'm sure most people would when you open Twitter and see like three different things you've got to read and like I'll find the time for that eventually. Newsletters are really great to see um, everything that got released in a week and prioritise which ones you want to read. Um, Bug Bites is, is published by Integrity and it is amazing at just getting all of the important stuff. And they've even got an even shorter version now that's more corporate, um, which is really good too. So I highly recommend um, that resource. And I'd recommend just following a bunch of people and seeing what they tweet. <laughs> You'll get a lot from just seeing what other people are tweeting. And the next thing is practice. Practice is the most important part of bug hunting. Like 100%. CTFs are great ways to experiment with a bug and an exploit. Um, Hacker 101, published by Hacker One, is my favorite CTF. Um, because it also lets you gain private invites and a private program is a great place to get started with bug hunting in a kind of a less competitive environment. But really, I think the best one is the Web Security Academy Labs. It is such a good mix of um, practice combined with what bugs are out there and how to exploit them. And it's all together in one space. I really like that as a resource. And finally actually hacking something. If you want to be a hacker, you're going to have to actually hack something eventually. So just have a go now. Like, don't leave it until you feel more prepared because you never will. You'll never feel like you know everything. Just have a go. Um, getting used to seeing what an actual website looks like on Burp is so much different than seeing what a um like a ctf looks like it's totally scary and intimidating but eventually you're gonna need to take that jump so why not be it as soon as possible you know the first time i was hacking i didn't know how to use burp i was hacking uber and one thing that's really important to think about is that you know you don't have this kind of critical mass of i am now ready to hack something that people who have known nothing about how the web works have still found bugs before. They have a harder time, yeah, but they don't, there's not a course, there's not this kind of prescribed methodology. I'm just making a suggestion. Now, if you want more information on resources, I have made this piece of generic advice, um, which has literally every resource I could think of. Um, and in the comments, there are even more resources. I made this last year, it's probably still relevant. Apart from one thing, uh, Pentester Land is now called Bug Bites, but apart from that, everything else is still relevant. It does it by types of resource, so what podcasts are available, what books are available, all that sort of stuff. There are so many resources out there. Um, and, you know, just because I haven't mentioned them doesn't mean that they're not good resources. Like, there's just so many. And with that, I just wanted to end on this one point, which is continuing education. Never stop learning. And, you know, learning never stops, even for the pros. Once you find your first bug or get your second bug, um, the beginner resources can get a little boring because even if you, even if you feel like you're a beginner, um, you kind of feel like you've outgrown them a little bit. Um, and... In that sense, a lot of these resources are way more focused on beginner or intermediate. The more you kind of go through, the more difficult it is to find resources. So I'm going to recommend the best place to learn is to get involved in the security community. You know, the community has been great to me and it's so good for expanding your learning, sharing articles, write-ups, videos, podcasts, 
bounce ideas off of people, steal their experience or steal their knowledge and say, do you want to collaborate? Um, all of these are amazing things that the security community offers when you start to get more advanced. Now, you also have in real life meetups um, that obviously aren't happening because of COVID. But if you're like me and you don't live somewhere with an IRL meetup because you live in a town in the middle of nowhere, um, a lot of them have now gone online. So you can network with people from all over the world now. And that's been really great to kind of see. And if you're listening to me talk right now at this conference, I'm giving to the community. I'm participating in the community. Um, And for me, it's just been like, this has been one of the major ways I learn and I approach hacking now. And for the community to continue being awesome, the best thing you can do is give back as soon as you feel ready to. You don't have to be um, super advanced. You don't have to be like an expert. You can be an advanced beginner or intermediate. Just give back. Write up a cool bug you found. Make videos. Um, stream. You know, release tools. Make them open source. Organize meetups locally or online. Um, share tips on Twitter. Help someone solve a CTF level that you've already done. You have a unique perspective, even if you're new, on what it's like to be new. And what that feels like is huge because a lot of people who make more complex resources don't remember what it's like to be new because that was a long time ago. Okay, okay. But what about resources particular? in particular? Well, specific advice resources, conferences like this one, um, when you feel more advanced, you'll be able to engage more, um, especially with complex ideas and start talking to people and chatting about your own work. Write-ups can be really useful, especially in seeing how people approach problems. And some resources even sort their content by experience level. So you can just sort it and go through it one at a time. And I think something else to consider is what are your weaknesses? What are you really bad at? What do you need to learn? That will tell you a lot about what you need to do next. For me, it's cross-site scripting. Not that good at it. So... Thank you very much for listening to me talk. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. You can contact me. Um, I've got Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Discord. Um, Here is an old screenshot of my Twitter page from March. Um, You're very welcome to contact me. The only thing I do ask is if you just send me a um, Twitter like app tweet first because I have my DMs turned off. Happy to chat in DMs. I just, if I leave them open, I get some abuse and it's not very nice and it doesn't make, it does not spark joy. Um, So happy to answer any questions. Um, Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Have a great rest of the conference, everybody.